I hope you are all seeing this real estate. Um, that modeling uh, presentation. Um, and it's hard to, because it's so hard to know who's on the other side and the kind of uh, experience you have. It's hard to tailor the message to the to the people. So let me explain um, my background and how I came up with uh, teaching Excel modeling. Uh, so I'm a fund manager. I've been doing fund manager fund management for more than ten years now. I have uh, I'm a partner and a portfolio manager in a small investment uh, management boutique in London. So a company that is authorized by the financial regulator here and can um, manage uh, institutional money, money. And I have raised, launched and managed real estate funds, mainly real estate related funds. Um, and over that uh, venture of raising and launching funds and then having to manage those funds. Um, I always came across different systems and different models, different language. Um, and I always found that Excel, although so simple, was the one that gave me the most flexibility um, in order to track price, manage exposures. Excel is so flexible uh, that it doesn't narrow uh, our creativity and allow us to do stuff that often other tools don't. <clears throat> and I think this is reality for many of you um, in big corporates, um, in big investment management companies often you have to deal with their systems and obviously the systems that those companies have are in place to mainly to keep the operations and the activities under control so those companies gain for doing that um, from that uh, angle but they lose some creativity uh, and because those uh, systems are not as flexible, it narrows the approach as well. So I found that Excel solves many of those problems. Uh, it is an extremely powerful tool um, with complexity. That, that um, flexibility comes at the expense often, once you start increasing the complexity of the models, comes at the expenses of uh, the system becoming a little bit uh, slower. Um, but that's the price, I guess. That's the price of creating something that is flexible. And, and nowadays, even machine learning uh, stuff and AI techniques can be used in, in Excel. Um, so it is an extremely powerful tool. And when I was setting up uh, my fund management business and felt the need to create a system, I was wondering and I looked around in the market um, for systems that could allow me to price the instruments, manage the risk, do the accounting, um, price the funds as, as you might expect. Doing a fund management activity, you are managing uh, money for external investors and that comes through an investment vehicle, which is a fund. So you have to price the assets of the fund. You have to price the shares of the fund or the units of the fund. You have to report to those investors the performance of the fund and the risk of the fund. You have to report to regulators a number of parameters that 
they require and at the same time you have to at all the time uh, keep a track on cash flows and bank accounts so it's, it's really hard to find a system uh, a third-party system uh, off the shelf that is able to do all of this so i created a system like this from scratch in in excel um and it is excel is an amazing tool because you get full transparency um and if the system is well designed you can figure out from a risk management point of view what drives what um and um learn in this in the process of building that system and learn about the relationship between the different variables um so this said this is kind of my background and how I came across excel and how i use excel uh, so as i said um I'm a fund manager uh, in the real estate uh, sector. And if you look around the real estate sector, and I guess most of the investment um, activities are supported by that. And that's the purpose of this course is understand the impact of that um in the investment you do so that is in reality everywhere uh, and in real estate that is king if you think about yourselves um what's the most valuable assets you have some of you will say it's probably the house and if you think about how you financed your house, you probably got a mortgage from, from a bank. So there you have, you have that in that investment uh, decision. For many of us, if we couldn't get access to a mortgage, we couldn't buy a house. It wouldn't be possible. We wouldn't have enough savings to, to, to make the acquisition. So just by looking at our individual examples, you understand how that is relevant. And the same happens at uh, a more professional level in the investment world. Um, but this also means that many uh, projects that you see around you only happen because the sponsors of those uh, projects can have access to that. And at this stage then becomes really important to understand the impact of using that in your models. What's the impact of using that in your investment decision? And that's kind of what we do in this course. So we go from the first principles of, and let me show you a very brief, uh, the course objectives. We go from the very basic stuff, like explaining what real estate that is, what are the main structures, uh, the main debt facilities if they are senior debt facilities or junior debt facilities what kind of security you have to provide to the lender when we are getting one of those facilities we then analyze the impact of using debt or gearing up on the investment from the investor point of view how does that increases your risk because if you are using that you become subordinated to the lenders and once you become subordinated to the lenders if there is a bankruptcy if there is a drop or fall in the value of the assets you become uh, the last 
to get paid. So you may not get paid anything because the lender will get, uh, will be the first to be paid and you as an investor, you get the first loss. And that first loss could be the entire amount of your equity investment. So we go through that and analyze the impact of using that in that um, investment decision. We then we then look at the different loan types uh, because within the different that um, structures we might have different uh, debt types. Uh, how those debt facilities are structured uh, from a cash flow point of view. If you have to pay interest um, or you are allowed to roll up the interest, if you can, if you have to amortize the capital of the loan, or you can just have bullet payments at the end. And at the same time, you have to look at the impact on financial covenants. So the bank will set rules um, in order to protect themselves. And those rules often have um, indicators. And those indicators are covenants that the bank sets to you. So we'll cover those covenants as well and model those covenants and figure out what's the best way to use different um, loan type facilities or even repayment facilities in order not to breach the covenants. Um, another topic that we cover in this course is the interest rate risk. Uh, because often uh, the debt facilities don't have fixed coupons and have just variable rates. Um, we have to manage that interest rate risk and understand that interest rate risk because what is affordable today might not be affordable tomorrow if interest rates go up dramatically and you have a variable variable rate uh, structure. So we analyze that as well and how to manage uh, those uh, that risk. So in a nutshell, I think these are the, the objectives of this course. Um, and let me let me now show you what we cover from a, a, the capital structure of the any investment decision. <clears throat> so as you can see in this capital structure, we have different types of debt. We start from covering and looking at senior debt. And the senior debt is the one that gets paid first. And because it is the one that gets paid first is the most safest way of lending money uh, to a company or to a project. But often this senior debt is restricted to uh, risk parameters. So you don't get 100% senior debt. You probably get 50% or 60% of your investment uh, as this type of debt facility. So if you don't have enough equity, you probably have to um, raise other type of debt. And once you start raising other debt facilities and once the risk um, increases, uh, the cost of that debt increases as well. So as you can see, the higher the risk, the most, the more expensive it becomes to, to raise that. So we go from senior debt to junior debt, then we can have mezzanine debt. And after the mezzanine debt, you start getting into the equity uh, within the equity type instruments and you get preferred equity, which is just a hybrid version of that and equity because you get 
a fixed coupon, but you don't get um, security. And then you have common equity, which is just the residual claim on the cash flows. So we cover all of this and we look at the impact of using the different uh, debt facilities versus the impact of using that debt facility in your equity returns. So the purpose of the main purpose of this course is analyzing the impact of using that in your equity returns. So if you are thinking about from a, an investor point of view, you are thinking that you want to maximize value and value can be maximized by using that. So you have to understand where that maximiz maximization happens. Sorry, Akash, you said, could you please put the PowerPoint presentation mode? Okay, sorry. I wasn't looking at the chat. Hope this is this is better. And so we covered these aspects of the, the capital structure and see the impact of this on the on the equity returns. And the next step we have just here an example of different capital structures that you can use. You can use, you can have, you could have access to all the different debt facilities, uh, which is not uh, uncommon, but often what you see is something like this. You have senior debt and you try to squeeze the more senior debt you can because it is cheaper. And often if you don't have, then if you still have a shortfall, you might get mes or junior or preferred equity. Uh, because at some point, because mes becomes very expensive, it will have a drag on the equity returns. But nevertheless, this is the different capital structures that you can use to finance any investment decision. Um, and the other thing that then we analyze is the repayment mechanisms. So what do I mean by repayment mechanisms? Often um, the bank provides you a debt facility, which, which could be a senior debt facility or junior debt facility or even a mass debt facility. Uh, but the bank sets different um, repayment or payment terms that often match the, the project cash flows profile. So you could have that facilities that don't have uh, amortization of the capital, but have just over the life of the loan, just have interest payments. So if you think what this means, if you just if you are just paying interest, you are keeping the outstanding balance of the debt facility the same throughout the life of the loan, which means that you keep your debt exposure the same. You don't gain leverage or you don't lose leverage. You keep it um, constant over the life of the loan. And that will have an impact on your equity returns. Uh, but the bank might see you as a, a riskier uh, borrower and might require some uh, amortization of capital. And you have here different ways of amortizing the capital. It doesn't matter what, what it means. Um, CA is just constant amortization, constant payment, and then constant payment with balloon payment. But what this means, all these three facilities means, is that over the life of the loan, because you are amortizing, repaying capital, you are losing leverage. And because you are losing leverage and the debt costs 
is the cheapest um, source of funding, your equity returns will be lowered by that fact. So <clears throat> if you want to compare any of these three facilities with the interest only facility, because in these three facilities, we are amortizing and repaying, repaying capital of the loan, and you are losing um, leverage, your returns, the equity returns, are lower in each one of these debt facilities versus the interest only, where you keep your leverage constant. So it is important to understand um, how the equity returns, uh, the equity performance change with the different loan repayment mechanisms. Uh, another facility that we cover is the rolled up facility. So the rolled up facility, you don't have any payment over the life of the loan. You get the money at the start, so you draw down the loan. You don't have any payment of interest or capital during the life of the loan. And, and at the term, at the maturity, you have to repay whatever is outstanding. And that amount includes interest and includes the initial loan amount. So, and that also means that, as you may imagine, that if you don't have any payments during the life of the loan and the interest uh, component is accruing over the life of the loan, by the end of the loan, you have a higher amount to repay than the initial amount, which means that your leverage increased over the life of the loan. And if that's the case, because the debt, um, the debt facility is cheaper than the, than the equity um, capital, you perform better. So you got, you increase your returns by using a rolled up facility just by the simple fact that you just increase your leverage over the life of the loan. Um, and on the other side, think about the banks, the lender that is providing you the money. Because the bank has uh, the mirroring effect of this, of, of, your, of your analysis. The bank is looking at these different facilities from the opposite angle with a rolled up facility they are increasing their exposure to the to the property and for that reason this that facility is more is riskier than the interest only facility and then any other of the these three constant uh, payment facilities which means that if the risk for the rolled up facility is higher than the interest only or any of the other facilities the interest rates on this rolled-up facility will be higher than the interest rate for the other facilities. Um, is either that or the money that the bank gives you under a rolled-up facility is less, is smaller, is lower than the money the bank provides you on the other facilities. Whatever is the case, it is relevant, it is important to understand the impact of each one of these facilities on the, on the income that you get, on the returns that the equity investor gets. So we go through, through all of that. Uh, we model each one of these facilities. Uh, we make assumptions about interest rates, about the money you get, about the amount that you have to, to repay as capital of the loan, the maturity of the loans, um, the covenants of the loans. So we integrate all of that in the Excel spreadsheet and then analyze the results. So here you have just an example of the what I would say, uh, the main goal of the, the analysis, which is understanding the impact of the leverage 
on the cost of capital and we have this orange line is the cost of capital and the cost of capital will be used to value um, to value the, 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 the investments the the property so as this is the outcome of the analysis uh, and as you can see it goes up initially so we have leverage here we have the LTV here so the higher the, the leverage what do we see we see that the cost of capital is increasing as you would expect because the higher the leverage the higher is the likelihood of having you uh, uh, bank uh, rotting so going to uh, default so if you are closer to get default the risk is just going to increase and for that reason the value of the project uh, doesn't follow a straight line so we see an increase in value initially with leverage but at some point it will decrease so understanding where these break-evens are or do you have the triggers is really important when you are modeling uh, your project and so this is the ultimate goal of the ultimate goal of this course and uh, we do all of that in just a very simple spreadsheet and let me let me share the spreadsheet with with you um, in a couple of in a couple of tabs you have all of this analysis done so as you can see we just have two main tabs which is the asset tab which is the property and we have the debt tab and we just have different types of facilities here with and without capital repayment we have the covenants and once we have all of this done and obviously everything being based from the property tab so we have just a property tab with cash flows so just a very simple property uh, investment project where you have tenants the tenants have to make payments uh, have to make rent payments all of that feeds the balance sheet of the of the property and from this balance sheet from this cash flow um, statement you get the cash flows that will allow you to pay your debt facilities so we get the cash flows from the from the property and we model the impact of the different debt facilities on those cash flows and by doing that you can capture that behavior you can capture how the cost of capital changes and how the value of the uh, investment changes as well so in a nutshell uh, that's what we do in this course.